everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Just Get Hired podcast, your guide to all things hiring, getting noticed, and getting promoted in this crazy job market. I'm your host, Jessica Fiesta George. Have you ever wondered how we can get high schoolers to start thinking about their careers while also providing business opportunities that impact the community? Well, joining me today is Tim Gorey, an accomplished leader, speaker, AI expert. Tim is a former software developer, chief technology officer, and chief communications officer in four different school districts over a 25-year career. Now he's the CEO and head coach for Baton Pass. He's also a leadership coach, and he owns a consulting firm focused on IT professionals and departments. He's also the co-founder of Sid. City Center AI, a company dedicated to building software that supports entrepreneurial programs in schools. He also leads the charge in developing cutting edge curriculum, supporting school reform through his work for the School to Business Association. I know that's a mouthful, but hopefully I got it right, Tim. I will make sure we get that right, but welcome into the Just Get Hired podcast. So you did. You did a great job. There is a lot going on there. There's a lot, but you've had a great career. And today we're going to talk about City Center AI, um, which is a groundbreaking initiative that's helping high school students start businesses with practical skills and giving them the hands-on experience while earning school credit, which I think is awesome. And City Center AI aims to um, help students by creating real business opportunities while they're in school. And I'm excited that you're gonna be able to share a little bit more about that. Are you ready to dive in? Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, first I wanna to get to know you. I know I said a mouthful earlier, but what inspired you to pursue a career in technology and mentorship? Well, the mentorship came way later, but the technology part was first. Um, I did a little bit in high school, um, interestingly enough, high school, my high school experience was kind of boring. I was, I didn't feel like it was very relevant to my life or the things I was interested in. So I spent a lot of time outside of school tinkering and doing things I was interested in. And one of those things was technology um, with my friends and building computers and playing games and all of that sort of thing, which is a common start for IT people. As I graduated from high school, went into the Air Force, and I got a job in the Air Force um, that was computer operations. And ironically, I uh, ended up working for 25 years in K-12 schools oh, in nice. California. Um, and I, I went there after the military uh, because it was a job working in IT in schools that was flexible around me going back to college. Um, and I really wanted to be a software developer and ended up, ended up working in a software company. I just ended up staying with schools. Okay. Um, and so, and, and really my, the evolution of that, uh, was really about creating schools using technology, creating schools that that were more like what I wish they were when I was in school and more relevant, um, allowed us to do things, you know, allow students to do things that they were interested in to learn about uh, real world scenarios uh, because I felt like academic work wasn't very real world. Uh, it was very preparatory for college, but but not really very preparatory for actual work or for starting a business. Well, first of all, thank you for your service. I want to learn a little bit more about City Center AI. I think it's a really interesting thing that you have uh, going on and really out of the box. What sparked the creation of City Center AI? Maybe just tell us a little bit more. Sure. Um, after I left schools, I moved to Missouri. Um, so I lived in California and worked in California for a long time. Um, and uh, when I left that, I moved to Missouri about three years ago. And about a year and a half ago, I met my business partner at a tech conference. So here I am um, really running a business that's about helping IT people make the transition to leadership, uh, which is kind of my specialty uh, from my CTO career. And uh, so I go to this conference uh, and I met this guy who was looking for a business partner and he had this idea that he had been sitting on basically for about six years. It was really about creating a program in high schools that would allow students to run real businesses 
in the context of high school. Um, and he described this idea to me and um, it, it really kind of was one of those things where it felt immediately like a continuation of my mission, my 25 mm -hmm. year mission in schools uh, to create relevance in schools. And I thought that would be the way, right? For those right. students who really don't see the relevance in typical academic classes, math, English, mm -hmm. social studies, and science, um, to be able to work on a business within school in replacement of those core classes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they get credit, core class credit, uh, graduation credit while they work on a business would be so relevant, you know, so actionable that that I think we might have something in that idea. Um, and so we worked on it for about a year. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we we came to a place in the development of that overall idea where we recognized that students, in order to do the idea, were going to need to have access to professional level AI chat tools like mm -hmm. ChatGPT4. Okay. And there's a problem right now in schools in that none of the professional level chat tools are really legal for schools to use because of the laws. There's a, a federal law called FERPA that is okay. about protecting students' personal information. Uh, and anytime you have a software that you want to bring into a school and use with mm -hmm. students, the software company has to certify all of the way that they deal with data to protect student information. And the very nature of AI chat tools are that whatever a student or a user might put in the prompt gets sort of brought into the overall database of, of the chat tool and can be exposed by other actors uh, who are able to get into or use that database. It's kind of inherently insecure from that perspective. And right. so we started thinking about the first thing we do before we try to do tackle this big, huge idea of entrepreneurship, real entrepreneurship in schools. Maybe the first thing we do is create a software, what we call an AI wrapper product that would protect student information and make uh, AI tools uh, FERPA compliant. And so okay. that's, that's kind of where we are today is really working on validating that tool as a business idea and developing that right now. Okay. Well, I wish they had something like that while I was in school. Maybe I would have paid attention a little bit better. <laughs> uh, but to be able to use uh, the math and the science and really understand how that relates to real life, you don't really feel that when you get out, like even into the real world. Some of the courses I know I took in high school aren't really, they're not relevant to what I do today. But if I could have understood why they were teaching that in the curriculum, maybe it could have done a little bit different, you know, of my career path, who knows, but it's an exciting thing. And you're keeping up with what's going on right now with AI and school, everyone's doing things on the computer. Besides the obvious, what practical skills do you think students will gain from participating in this? I don't want to sound too critical of our school okay. system because the, our school system works for some people for some students. And I think that's, that's the point. There are some reformers, school reformers who come in and say, trash the whole system, right? Start over. Um, that's not me. My point of view is, is that we need to be truthful in our education system about what it is that we're actually aiming at. What you'll hear a lot of times and what educators will say is that the job of school is to prepare students for the world to be successful in the world outside of school. And yet the things that we do in school don't really lead to that. We've got really no evidence, no, no research that, that points to the things that we learn in school actually help us be successful outside of school. Now, so the presupposition that we have in schools is that, that uh, is people who are successful outside of school People who, people who go to college and finish college mm -hmm. tend to be more successful, right? Which is a reasonable assumption when you're just looking at 
the amount of money that people make, you know, uh, right. uh, on average, right? People who go to go to college and finish college tend to make a certain amount of money over their lifetimes more than people who don't. But it's in in reality, though, that is a a function of a working system that has gates in it that don't mm -hmm. allow you to be a manager, for instance, unless you have a bachelor's degree in college, right? It's not about the skills that you develop right. in school that make you successful in the real world. It's about kind of a fake system that we've created <laughs> that says, you know, if you do these things, then you get to the next gate and the next gate opens to you and then you get, a, you get access to this mm -hmm. next level. Right. And then if you do these things in that level, then you, you open another gate that gives you access to the next level. Um, but, but there's no research that really correlates the skill, any skills that we teach in school uh, to success in, in the real world. You know, like I'm famous for saying, you know, when I was in school, I was that kid that was in the back of the class raising my hand going, how are we going to use this in the real world? <laughs> right. And then the teacher, you know, in high school, especially, they get a little annoyed with me. Uh, but usually the answer was, well, you've got to learn this in order to be successful and get into college. And that was their answer. Uh, mm -hmm. And my response to that would have been, well, no, I'm talking about the real world. What if I don't want to go to college? What if I don't want to pay to do more of this practice? Mm -hmm. But I actually want to go and do real work in the real mm -hmm. world and have a real impact and what's preparing, what about this is preparing me. Now, the reality is, are there things about math and language arts and social studies and science that help you in, in, in uh, real world jobs? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. Right. But we don't do a good job in schools of connecting those real world applications to the learning that we do exactly. in the siloed subject class. And mm -hmm. so really this whole effort, this idea is, is, is an idea that um, is about flipping the application on its head and starting with the application of the knowledge and working backwards, because that's what we do. That's what we usually do in the real world. When in real right. world work, we start with a goal. We have something we're looking to accomplish. And then we recognize, here are the things I need to learn along the way to accomplish that goal. And then you go after the learning and you learn what you need to learn to accomplish the goal. In school, you're set in a class where the goal is to learn, but there is no real world goal right. of what to do with the learning. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the, the, exactly so what, what we, I was talking about earlier. I mean, there. Yeah. It made no so, sense why we were learning how to do trigonometry when I knew I was not going to be in a math field. And what's what's interesting about that, and, and I had mentioned before that there are some um, students who are served well in that mm -hmm. environment, right, that, that do okay. There, it's about 40%. 40% of our students um, go on from, do well in high school, 3.0 GPA or above. And, and f interestingly enough, about 60% of our students attempt college, but only mm. about 40% of them finish. And it tends mm. to be that same 40% who did well in school, um, in, in K through 12 school, right? And right. so um, what, what we find is uh, I, we've done enough research on this in a school district that I was in that was very large in, in uh, the Bay Area of California. And what we found was from a motivational standpoint, the students that were getting above a 3.0 GPA were kind of one of two types of students. They were either um, students who had a fairly clear picture of what they wanted to do in their career mm -hmm. and that job that they or, or career that they had connected with that they really wanted was fairly academically connected, meaning like a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist. Right. These are careers that require a lot of education in order to even get into them. That academic work is fairly connected to success in that career. And so we have about 20% of our total students, half of the 
that get 3.0 or GPA above that have really identified what they want to do with their lives. And they've identified that in order to do that, they've got to do well in school. And then the other half of the 3.0 and GPA, GPA and above students, which is another 20% of your total, are students who just report loving school. They enjoy the structure of school. They believe that school itself has an inherent value, that just mm -hmm. getting in a classroom situation and learning about stuff is, is important and good. They've probably loved every teacher they've ever had. They are your sort of teacher's pets. Um, right. Just like the structure of school, like school itself. Now, what's interesting is the vast majority of those students, when they get out of school, mm -hmm. become teachers, hmm. right? They exactly. follow their yeah. interests. They love school. Um, we actually asked um, our teachers in our school district after we found out about this section of students, about 20% of the total students that just love school. We mm -hmm. asked our teachers how, how, whether they, what kind of student they were and gave them four choices. And 80% of our teachers said they were the kind of student that just loved school when they were in school. So, so those students a lot of times become teachers, um, either okay. at the K-12 or the college level. The rest of the students that are 3.0 and below, that's 60% of your high school mm -hmm. students. And 95% yeah. of those students said they, they could do better. They could get a 3.0, but they had trouble understanding why they should do the work. Um, they didn't right. see uh, a connection between the academic work and anything that they cared about or that they thought was important. And then about 5% of the students that get it below a 3.0 said they were trying as hard as they could, that they were connected with schoolwork. They knew it was important but they just couldn't mm -hmm. get the grades. They, they really just struggled. But that was a very small number of students who just reported, right. you know, I'm not getting a 3.0 because um, because I'm struggling, because I'm trying, but I, it's just not working. What we're trying to co go after is that 55, 60% of students who are not seeing the value in academic work in school and, mm -hmm. um, and need uh, an application uh, centric approach. And we think, we think now we, we wouldn't expect that every student would be interested in being an entrepreneur and starting right. a business themselves, but we want to create a program that allows for those students who are entrepreneurial to start businesses and other students who are not as entrepreneurial, but who aren't interested in regular academic classes to join those students and support them and work in their businesses mm -hmm. as sort of employees and still get credit for doing that. So, so that's kind of the, the overall concept that we're, we're aiming at. I know it took a while to explain that, but <laughs> it, it's a core issue. I think we have an education where we've got mm -hmm. most of our students who are kind of checking out and regular school approaches are really not working for them to engage them. Gotcha. Well, okay. So I'm, I'm imagining you're just rolling this out. Do you, how many schools do you have in the program? How many businesses and how do businesses get involved um, in participating in something like this? That's a good question. Um, we, we have a, a couple of schools who are sort of having a conversation with us right now about okay. how this might work. Um, we aren't actually doing the full blown program yet. Okay. Um, because we have, as we've gotten involved in an incubator program, uh, we actually are involved in a business incubator program called uh, Codify, uh, run by a co an organization called Codify out of Springfield, Missouri. Um, okay. That their, their advice to us as we have started developing this business idea is to really pare it down to just the AI software and start with that. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then expand as we start creating revenue um, off of the AI software. And doing it as an AI, standalone AI sort of wrapper gives us the ability to focus on different customer groups like uh, homeschool families and uh, who are interested in protecting their students' information. And private schools and charter schools and, and we're kind of working our way up to the larger public school situation. And so going through that incubator program is not only allowing us to really refine um, our business idea um, mm -hmm. as a model, 
So, so that's kind of where we are right now. We've got um, a, a school, Centennial High School in Bakersfield, California, and their teacher um, that that runs a really uh, interesting entrepreneurial program already. Okay. Uh, involved with us to sort of advise us, and we're getting opportunities to work with the students directly. Uh, okay. to really refine the ideas of what's going to work and what's not going to work. But that school in particular is the con- is the leader in the country of all high schools in a program called Virtual Enterprise, which is a entrepreneurial simulation class um, where high schoolers do two periods a day simulating a business. And nice. interestingly enough, um, back in the 1990s, that was where I, at the Kern High School District in Bakersfield, California, where I grew up, is where I started my software development career um, on that program, Virtual Enterprise, when it was in its infancy. We, I created the uh, online banking system oh. that they use to uh-huh. send virtual money back and forth between uh, virtual companies, which are represented by different high schools uh, around the state. And so when we started... We started with five high schools in the entire state of California, and over five years grew that to about 250 high schools. So, um, so that was it's kind of funny because that was the beginning of my software development career, and now it's kind of come around full circle, and I'm working with yeah. some of the virtual enterprise schools to work on this idea to to move it from being a virtual enterprise course to a real enterprise course, <laughs> and the yeah, idea. Behind all of that is that it, as students start up real businesses that support, uh, that provide services to the to other businesses and people in their local community, they're going to bring in revenue, and a percentage of that revenue will go back to the school um, to support the program, and and really it's like the students are kind of using the school as a co-working space, and they're paying for their co-working space with with a percentage of their revenue. That's awesome. Well, you're a success story. And I, like you said, it's a full circle moment. It'll be great to see what happens next. Um, what advice would you have then for aspiring technology leaders and entrepreneurs? You know, my advice to technology leaders is always to recognize that that most of your technology leaders come from the technology space. They were technology professionals, right? Before mm-hmm. they became managers, uh, people managers. And what happens most often in those situations is those people who are really good IT professionals uh, get mm-hmm. promoted into management and they take the skills and the understanding of how things work from their IT professional um, perspective and they try to apply that to people. And usually it doesn't work very well. So (laughs) that's why my coaching business exists really is to help with that, that challenge of moving from the, the controlling and management of things to the leadership of people. It's a completely Mm -hmm. different set of skills. And so for IT leaders, I would just suggest, you know, are you trying to manage people like you manage the technology or are you doing something completely different from a different paradigm entirely? And if you don't feel like you've completely moved over uh, mm-hmm. into the realm of people leadership and are doing that really well, come to me. I'd love to work with you and help you uh, make that transition successfully. For entrepreneurs, um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned in the last year and a half, really um, working hard on on a completely new concept, is that I fall in love with a product that you create before you have an opportunity to validate whether or not you're really solving real problems that your potential clients or customers actually have. And so I think where we've kind of had fits and starts with this whole thing is we fell in love with our idea, right? Right. (laughs) Because it it speaks to me personally in my entire career. Um, And we started the process of creating a business and and a website and um, technologies and curriculum that sort of follow this idea of of what we think schools need. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that there's, I think there's validation in that to a certain degree, but it, it's really better as we're going through this incubator process. One of the things that I've learned um, that I'm really excited about is that they flip that idea on its head and they say, no, 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 
before you go out and spend a bunch of money and spend a bunch of time on an idea that on developing an idea that you have, you need to uh, develop an interview process and go interview mm. potential clients and find out is this idea really something that's going to sell? Is it something that solves real problems that they have and that they recognize that they have? Or are you going to go into that interview process and really start talking to people and find out that it wasn't your original idea that is the idea that's going to work? It's something slightly different. And we're right in the process now of interviewing people to find out what what are their real problems and and what is the software and the solutions that are actually going to tackle those real problems that they have and, and hit them right where their need is. And so that's that's the thing for entrepreneurs that I would say is start with talking to your customers and validating your idea before you spend too much time uh, developing something. Well, your insights and dedication to helping students for the last 25 years and continuing to grow with hopefully this tool. I hope it's a success because it's really going to nurture our next generation of leaders and young entrepreneurs. And it's really inspiring. Hopefully one day when the program is out and everything is running, um, maybe, maybe later down the road, we can get a student to come in and share their experiences and just, uh, you know, watch as this platform takes off. But for our listeners who want to learn more about citycenter.ai, Baton Pass, connect with you, what's the best way? You can go to my website. You see my name on the screen there. It's Tim Gorey. So timgorey.com. It doesn't get any easier than that. And everything that I'm doing is connected to that website. So you can get to my Baton Bass website from there and citycenter.ai and all the other projects. Okay. Well, I'll include that in the show notes. So be sure to go follow Tim and go to his website, learn more about all of the businesses he's involved in. Um, Also, make sure you follow Just Get Hired on all of your social media platforms. You can find me on LinkedIn by searching my full name, Jessica Fiesta George. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a rating and a comment on YouTube or on iTunes so you can keep this podcast going and send some good vibes to Tim as he embarks in his journey to develop um, this platform. But thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. 